It's really difficult to find an interior defensive lineman who actually adds a lot of value to your defense. As it stands today, there's really only five or six that I think would be worth a first round selection or worth more than 15 million a year. It's a position that's kind of similar to running back where there's a few game changers and then a bunch of solid players that get the job done but don't necessarily offer anything that's too difficult to find. At this point, I think Jeffrey Simmons is right outside of that top tier of players like Chris Jones and Grady Jarrett who consistently pressure the quarterback and actually change an offensive coordinator's game plan. Some Titans fans are putting him in that top tier right now, but I think he still needs a good amount of development before we put him up there with those guys. And that's not at all to say that I don't think he can get there. He's still a young player and there's no reason to think that he's reached his ceiling. In my opinion, Jeffrey Simmons is a top 20 defensive lineman in the NFL, but he has the potential to be in the top five and for him to end up as a slam dunk draft pick, I think that he needs to reach that mark. The biggest thing holding Simmons back at this point is consistency as a pass rusher. His flashes are spectacular, but he'll have games where he completely disappears, and his performance seems to correlate pretty significantly with the level of competition that he's facing. If you follow me on Twitter, which you should definitely be doing, I tweeted a highlight video of Jeffrey Simmons, and about half of the clips were from two games against Minnesota and Houston, who just happened to have terrible interior offensive lines. When Simmons has a huge athletic advantage, he looks unstoppable, but when that gap shrinks, he has to be more of a technician, which has mixed results. Simmons ranked 48th in the NFL in pass rush win percentage, and his 67.4 PFF pass rushing grade ranked 43rd among defensive linemen. He had 41 pressures, which ranked 16th in the NFL, but he played so many snaps that his pressure rate of 7.6% only ranked 46th. I find it a little strange that Simmons' pass rushing performance is so average given how good of a run defender he is. And there are a lot of linemen that are good in run defense but can't get to the quarterback, but Simmons' role as a run defender is not that different from his role as a pass rusher. His job is to penetrate into the backfield and disrupt the play, and a lot of times he's using pass rushing moves and techniques when defending the run. Simmons ranked 12th in the NFL with a 78.1 PFF run defense grade, and Quinnen Williams was the only player under 24 years old who graded higher than him. A big reason that Simmons is so effective as a run defender and that he has the potential to be so effective as a pass rusher is that he has great athleticism for his position. Since he tore his ACL before the combine, we don't have many testing numbers, but we do have plenty of film against NFL competition where he's the biggest and most explosive player on the field. We do know that his arm length is 34 and a half inches, which is 88th percentile for defensive linemen, and arm length is, in my opinion, the most important physical metric for anyone who plays on the line of scrimmage. I talk all the time about how important it is to establish first contact, and the best way to do that consistently is to have long arms. So a common acronym that's used when teaching run defense is SOTA, which stands for Strike, Observe, Discard, and Attack, and Simmons' length helps him on each of those steps. Taking a look at this play against the Vikings, which like I said earlier will be a common theme, Simmons is playing three technique, meaning he's lined up on the outside shoulder of the guard. Minnesota's running outside zone, and the left guard is going to try to reach block Jeffrey Simmons. Once the ball is snapped, Simmons strikes with both hands before the guard can make any contact. The only real criticism I have of this play is that his inside hand should be on the chest to protect more against the reach block, but that's splitting hairs. What's most important about his striking on this play is that his hands are below the shoulder pads, his pad level is lower than the guards, and his base is square with the line of scrimmage. On the second step, observe, Simmons is reading the direction of the run and making sure that he's working towards the play side. His initial read was the offensive lineman's neck, but he still needs to make sure that the running back is going in that direction as well. While he's reading the play, Simmons is also trying to extend the length between himself and the guard, who's trying to get chest to chest with him so that he can secure the reach. At the same time, he continues to get what coaches call hips to the gap, meaning he needs to cover up the B-gap that he's responsible for. Next, he discards or sheds the block, which is no problem given how good of a position he's put himself in up to this point. But shedding a reach block is a bit different than other blocks. 
Since the guard is attacking the outside shoulder, Simmons needs to flatten the guard's angle to prevent him from getting the leverage that he wants. He does this by pulling with the inside hand and pushing with the outside hand. Once he's flattened the guard and established enough separation, he disengages and makes the stop. As you can see, every single phase of this play was made easier by the length advantage that Jeffrey Simmons had, and when you combine that with near perfect technique, he can pretty much single handedly shut a play down. This sort of play is what makes Jeffrey Simmons different from most of the other solid defensive linemen that I compared him to earlier. Plenty of defensive linemen have a good enough anchor to be able to hold their ground and fill a gap, but not as many have the athleticism to counter zone blocking while keeping their balance and using their hands properly. That's why outside zone has become a staple of so many offenses because there just aren't a lot of linemen that can defend it consistently. If we compare Simmons' performance on zone runs to gap runs, we see that he was way more effective against the former. Points saved per play is my favorite run defense metric, and it basically quantifies the effect that a player has on the expected points added for a given play. And Simmons ranked 7th in the NFL among defensive linemen against zone runs, but only 68th against power runs. I only include statistics if they're backed up by what I see on film, and most of Simmons' best plays this season were against zone blocking. Looking at this play against Cleveland, Simmons' initial key is the center, but when the center steps right, Simmons knows the left guard is going to try to reach him. This half a second where Simmons has to shift his focus means that he'll be making contact at about the same time as the guard, so he won't have that initial advantage. His inside hand placement is good, but he isn't able to get his outside hand on the shoulder, so the guard's able to work towards his shoulder. But like I talked about in the Nate Davis video, a guard is most vulnerable on a reach block when he's trying to turn his hips because he sacrifices most of his anchor. So when Joel Batonio does this, Simmons extends his arms and uses the guard's momentum to close the gap. This forces Kareem Hunt to cut back and Simmons is able to disengage and meet him in the backfield. I don't think it's much of a stretch to say that Jeffrey Simmons single-handedly kept Tennessee from having a bad run defense last season. For as bad as Tennessee was defensively, they were about middle of the road defending the run by most metrics, but just like with Simmons individually, Tennessee's defense was much more effective against zone runs than they were against power. Given that Jeffrey Simmons was the only Titans defender who shared this discrepancy, I think it's fair to say that he had a lot to do with Tennessee's relative success against zone blocking. Simmons isn't just good at defeating reach blocks, he's able to recognize when he's in a bad position and he needs to change his approach on the fly. Ideally, he would beat every block with perfect technique like on the first play that we discussed, but sometimes he'll take a bad first step like on this play against Cleveland, and he'll need to adjust his strategy and use his opponent's positional advantage against him. Sometimes he'll just get beat, at least at the beginning of the play, but he understands that trying to recover his losses would only make the situation worse. Right here, Houston's running inside zone, and the right guard lands a good stiff arm that widens Simmons' inside shoulder and gives Titus Howard an easy angle to make first contact and secure the reach block. As the play develops, Howard extends this positional advantage, and a gap emerges down the middle for David Johnson. Instead of continuing to try to win a block that he's already lost, which would take him even more out of the play, he stops and sheds and is able to make the stop. And you can't just run wide zone or stretch to the opposite side because unlike most defensive tackles, Jeffrey Simmons has really good speed and he can shut down the play if he's left unblocked on the back side. When Simmons wins, it's usually because of good fundamentals like attacking with the hands and keeping his body square and his pad level low, but when he loses, it's because he failed to do those things. Plays like this against Cincinnati, where Simmons gives a really weak punch, if you can even call it that, are frustrating because there's so many examples of him completely resetting the line of scrimmage because his punch is so violent. The most common reason that Simmons loses in run defense is also what I think holds him back as a pass rusher, and that's failing to establish low pad level. The saying low man wins applies to a lot of things in football, but it's especially relevant on the line of scrimmage because it's so much harder to drive a player back when you're standing straight up. I think the fact that Simmons played the fifth most snaps of any defensive lineman in the NFL has a lot to do with this inconsistency because there are just a lot of reps where he's clearly winded and not pass rushing with the violence that he's capable of. He also received a lot of double teams, especially as the season progressed because he was clearly the number one pass rushing threat on the field, 
but I think the additions of Danico Autry and Bud Dupree should help with both of these issues because the more talent that you have on the front four, the closer you can get to an actual rotation of players and the less offenses will be able to just focus on one guy. There's still a lot of reason to be optimistic about Simmons developing into a consistent pass rusher because the peaks are so high. When he gets low and lands his punches well, he looks as dominant as anyone besides Aaron Donald. On this play against Houston, Simmons splits the center in half and attacks the right shoulder. For the most part, he's sacrificing hand placement for leverage, which is perfectly fine as long as it's purposeful. So his first move is to dip his shoulder low and get as close to the lineman as possible. Because he closes the gap so quickly, the center doesn't have time to match his pad level, and he has to lean forward to engage the block. Simmons still lands a punch to the chest, but since he's already won the leverage battle, he can just drive through the center's shoulder and get to the quarterback. Simmons' play strength is great to begin with, but if you give him any sort of leverage advantage, it's pretty much over. He single-handedly shut down Minnesota's attempt at a game-winning drive with just a simple bull rush because he combined his physical dominance with good technique. Jeffrey Simmons has the ability to significantly raise the ceiling of Tennessee's defense because one good pass rusher can really make a pass rush as a whole good. If he can improve his ability to beat double teams and refine his technique so that the flashes of dominance happen more often, I think he has a legitimate chance to break out this year. If he were to stop developing right now, he's still a reliable, high-caliber defensive lineman, but I think his ceiling is way higher than that. If you enjoy my film breakdowns, consider subscribing and also follow me on Twitter and I'll put the link on the screen.